An Anarchist, A Desperate Tale, by Joseph Conrad, read by Donald Miller. That year I spent the best two months of the dry season on one of the estates, in fact on the principal cattle estate of a famous meat extract manufacturing company, BOS. You have seen the three magic letters on the advertisement pages of magazines and newspapers, in the windows of provision merchants, and on calendars for next year you receive by post in the month of November. They scatter pamphlets also, written in a sickly enthusiastic style and in several languages, giving statistics of slaughter and bloodshed enough to make a Turk turn faint. The art, illustrating that literature, represents in vivid and shining colors a large and enraged black bull stamping upon a yellow snake writhing in emerald green grass with a cobalt blue sky for a background. It is atrocious and it is an allegory. The snake symbolizes disease, weakness, perhaps mere hunger which last is the chronic disease of the majority of mankind. Of course, everybody knows the BOS Limited with its unrivaled products, Bonobos, Jelly Bows, and the latest unequaled perfection, Tribos, whose nourishment is offered to you not only highly concentrated, but already half digested. Such apparently is the love that limited company bears to its fellow men even as the love of the father and mother penguin for their hungry fledglings. Of course, the capital of a country must be productively employed. I have nothing to say against the company, but being myself animated by feelings of affection towards my fellow men, I am saddened by the modern system of advertising. Whatever evidence it offers of enterprise, ingenuity, impudence, and resource in certain individuals, it proves to my mind the wide prevalence of that form of mental degradation which is called gullibility. In various parts of the civilized and uncivilized world, I have had to swallow BOS, with more or less benefit to myself, though without great pleasure. Prepared with hot water and abundantly peppered to bring out the taste, this extract is not really unpalatable but I have never swallowed its advertisements. Perhaps they have not gone far enough. As far as I can remember, they can make no promise of everlasting youth to the users of BOS, nor yet have they claimed the power of raising the dead for their estimable products. Why this austere reserve, I wonder? But I don't think they would have had me even on these terms. Whatever form of mental degradation I may being but human, be suffering from, it is not the popular form. I am not gullible. I have been at some pains to bring out distinctly this statement about myself in view of the story which follows. I have checked the facts as far as possible. I have turned up the files of French newspapers, and I have also talked with the officer who commands the military guard on the Ile Royale when in the course of my travels I reached Guyana. I believe the story to be in the main true. It is the story that no man, I think, would ever invent about himself, for it is neither grandiose nor flattering, nor yet funny enough to gratify a perverted vanity. It concerns the engineer of the steam launch belonging to the Maranon cattle estate of the BOS Company Limited. This estate is also an island, an island as big as a small province, lying in the estuary of a great South American river. It is wild and not beautiful, but the grass growing on its low plains seems to possess exceptionally nourishing and flavoring qualities. It resounds with the lowing of innumerable herds, a deep and distressing sound under the open sky, rising like a monstrous protest of prisoners condemned to death. On the mainland, across twenty miles of discolored muddy water, there stands a city whose name, let us say, is Horta. But the most interesting characteristic of this island, which seems like a sort of penal settlement for condemned cattle, consists 
in its being the only known habitat of an extremely rare and gorgeous butterfly. The species is even more rare than it is beautiful, which is not saying little. I have already alluded to my travels. I traveled at that time, but strictly for myself, and with a moderation unknown in our days of round-the-world tickets. I even traveled with a purpose. As a matter of fact, I am, ha ha ha, a desperate butterfly slayer. <laughs> this was the tone in which Mr. Henry Gee, the manager of the cattle station, alluded to my pursuits. He seemed to consider me the greatest absurdity in the world. On the other hand, the BOS Company Limited represented to him the acme of the 19th century's achievement. I believe that he slept in his leggings and spurs. His days he spent in the saddle flying over the plains, followed by a train of half-wild horsemen who called him Don Enrique, and who had no definite idea of the BOS Company Limited, which paid their wages. He was an excellent manager, but I don't see why, when we, at meals, he should have thumped me on the back with loud, derisive inquiries. How's the deadly sport today? Butterfly is going strong? <laughs> Especially as he charged me two dollars per diem for the hospitality of the BOS Company Limited. Capital one million five hundred thousand pounds, fully paid up, in whose balance sheet for that year those monies are no doubt included. I don't think I can make it anything less in justice to my company, he had remarked with extreme gravity when I was arranging with him the terms of my stay on the island. His chaff would have been harmless enough if intimacy of intercourse and the absence of all friendly feeling were not a thing detestable in itself. Moreover, his facetiousness was not very amusing. It consisted in the wearisome repetition of descriptive phrases applied to people with a burst of laughter. Desperate butterfly slayer, ha ha ha, was one sample of his peculiar wit, which he himself enjoyed so much. And in the same vein of exquisite humor, he called my attention to the engineer of the steam launch. One day, as we strolled on the path by the side of the creek, the man's head and shoulders emerged above the deck, over which were scattered various tools of his trade and a few pieces of machinery. He was doing some repairs to the engines. At the sound of our footsteps, he raised anxiously a grimy face with a pointed chin and a tiny fair mustache. What could be seen of his delicate features under the black smudges appeared to me wasted and livid in the greenish shade of the enormous tree spreading its foliage over the launch moored close to the bank. To my great surprise, Harry Gee addressed him as Crocodile, in that half-cheering, half-bullying tone which is characteristic of self-satisfaction in his delectable kind. How does the work get on, Crocodile? I should have said before that the amiable Harry had picked up French of a sort somewhere, in some colony or other, and that he pronounced it with a disagreeable forced precision as though he meant to guide the language. The man in the launch answered him quickly in a pleasant voice. His eyes had a liquid softness, and his teeth flashed dazzlingly white beneath his thin, drooping lips. The manager turned to me very cheerfully and loud, explaining, I call him Crocodile because he lives half in, half out of the creek. Amphibious, see? There is nothing else amphibious living on the island except crocodiles, so he must belong to the species, eh? But in reality, he's nothing less than an un citoyen anarchiste de Barcelona. A citizen anarchist from Barcelona, I repeated stupidly, looking down at the man. He had turned to his work in the engine well of the launch and presented his bowed back to us. In that attitude, I heard him protest very audibly. I do not even know Spanish. Hey, what? You dare to deny you come from over there? The accomplished manager was down on him truculently. 
At this, the man straightened himself up, dropping a spanner he had been using, and faced us, but he trembled in all his limbs. I deny nothing, 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 he said excitedly. He picked up the spanner and went to work again, without paying any further attention to us. After looking at him for a moment or so, we went away. Is he really an anarchist, I asked, when out of earshot. I don't care a hang what he is, answered the humorous official of the BOS company. I gave him the name because it suited me to label him in that way. It's good for the company. For the company, I exclaimed, stopping short. Aha, he triumphed tilting up his hairless pug face and straddling his thin long legs. That surprises you. I am bound to do my best for my company. They have enormous expenses. Why, our agent in Horta tells me they spend 50,000 pounds every year in advertising all over the world. One can't be too economical in working the show. Well, just you listen. When I took charge here, the estate had no steam launch, I asked for one, and kept on asking by every mail till I got it. But the man they sent out with it chucked his job at the end of two months, leaving the launch moored at the pontoon in Horta. Got a better screw at a sawmill up the river, blast him. And ever since, that has been the same thing. Any Scotch or Yankee vagabond that likes to call himself a mechanic out here gets 18 pounds a month, and the next, you know, he's cleared out, after smashing something as likely as not. I give you my word that some of the objects I've had for engine drivers couldn't tell the boiler from the funnel. But this fellow understands his trade, and I don't mean him to clear out, see? And he struck me lightly on the chest for emphasis, disregarding his peculiarities of manner, I wanted to know what all this had to do with the man being an anarchist. Come, cheered the manager. If you saw suddenly a barefooted, unkempt chap slinking amongst the bushes on the sea face of the island, and at the same time observed less than a mile from the beach a small schooner full of niggers hauling off in a hurry, you wouldn't think the man fell there from the sky, would you? And it could be nothing else but either that or Cayenne. I've got my wits about me. Directly I sighted this queer game, I said to myself, escaped convict. I was certain of it as I am of seeing you standing here this minute. So I spurred on straight at him. He stood his ground for a bit on a sand hillock, crying out, Monsieur, Monsieur, Eretis. Then, at the last moment, broke and ran for his life. Says I to myself, I'll tame you before I'm done with you. So, without a single word, I kept on, heading him off here and there. I rounded him up towards the shore, and at last I had him corralled on a spit, his heels in the water, and nothing but sea and sky at his back. With my horse pawing the sand and shaking his head within a yard of him, he folds his arms on his breast, then, and stuck his chin up in a sort of desperate way. But I wasn't to be impressed by the beggar's posturing. Says I, you're a runaway convict. When he heard French, his chin went down and his face changed. I deny nothing, he says, panting yet, for I had kept him skipping about in front of my horse pretty smartly. I asked him what he was doing there. He had got his breath by then, and explained that he had meant to make his way to a farm which he understood, from the schooner's people, I suppose, was to be found in the neighborhood. At that I laughed aloud, and he got uneasy. Had he been deceived? Was there no farm within walking distance? I laughed more and more. He was on foot, and of course the first bunch of cattle he came across would have stamped him to rags under their hooves. A dismounted man caught on the feeding grounds hasn't got a ghost of a chance. My coming upon you like this has certainly saved your life, I said. He remarked that perhaps it was so, but that for his part he had imagined I wanted to kill him under the hooves of my horse. I assured him that nothing would have been easier had I meant it, 
And then we came to a sort of dead stop. For the life of me, I didn't know what to do with this convict, unless I'd chucked him into the sea. It occurred to me to ask him what he had been transported for. He hung his head. What is it, says I? Theft, murder, rape, or what? I wanted to hear what he had to say for himself, though of course I expected it would be some sort of lie. But all he said was, make it what you like. I deny nothing. It is no good denying anything. I looked him over carefully, and a thought struck me. They've got anarchists there, too, I said. Perhaps you're one of them. I deny nothing whatever, monsieur, he repeats. This answer made me think that perhaps he was not an anarchist. I believe those damn lunatics are rather proud of themselves. If he had been one, he would have probably confessed straight out. What were you before you became a convict? Avrier, he says, and a good workman, too. At that, I began to think he must be an anarchist after all. That's the class they mostly come from, isn't it? I hate the cowardly, bomb-throwing brutes. I almost made up my mind to turn my horse short round and leave him to starve or ground where he was, whichever he liked best. As to crossing the island to bother me again, the cattle would see to that. I don't know what induced me to ask. What sort of workman? I didn't care a hang whether he answered me or not, but when he said it once, mechanic, I nearly jumped out of the saddle with excitement. The launch had been lying disabled and idle in the creek for three weeks. My duty to the company was clear. He noticed my start, too, and there we were for a moment or so staring at each other as if bewitched. Get up on my horse behind me, I told him. You shall put my steam launch to rights. These are the words in which the worthy manager of the Maranon estate related to me the coming of the supposed anarchist. He meant to keep him out of a sense of duty to the company, and the name he had given him would prevent the fellow from obtaining employment anywhere in Horta. The vaqueros of the estate, when they went on leave, spread it all over the town. They did not know what an anarchist was, nor yet what Barcelona meant. They called him Anarchisto di Barcelona, as if it were his Christian name and his surname. But the people in the town had been reading in their papers about the anarchists in Europe and were very much impressed. Over the jocular edition of Di Barcelona, Mr. Harry Gee chuckled with immense satisfaction. That breed is particularly murderous, isn't it? It makes the sawmills crowd still more afraid of having anything to do with him, see? He exulted candidly. I hold him by that name better than if I had him chained up by the leg to the deck of the steam launch. And Mark, he added, after a pause, he does not deny it. I am not wronging him in any way. He is a convict of some sort anyhow. But I suppose you pay him some wages, don't you? I asked. Wages? He don't need no stinking wages. What does he want with money here? He gets his food from my kitchen and his clothing from the store. Of course, I'll give him something at the end of the year, but you don't think I'd employ a convict and give him the same money I would give an honest man. I'm looking after the interests of my company first and last. I admitted that, for a company spending 50,000 pounds every year in advertising, the strictest economy was obviously necessary. The manager of the Maranon Estancia grunted approvingly. And I'll tell you what, he continued, if I were certain he's an anarchist and he had the cheek to ask me for money, I would give him the toe of my boot. However, let him have the benefit of the doubt. I am perfectly willing to take it that he has done nothing worse than to stick a knife into somebody with extenuating circumstances. French fashion, don't you know? But that subversive sanguinary rot of doing away with all law and order in the world makes my blood boil. It's simply cutting the ground from under the feet of every decent, respectable, hard-working person. I tell you that the consciences of people who have them like you or I, must be protected in some way, or else the first low scoundrel that came along would in every respect be just as good as myself, wouldn't he now? And that's absurd. 
He glared at me. I nodded slightly and murmured that doubtless there was much subtle truth in his view. The principal truth discovered in the views of Paul the engineer was that a little thing may bring about the undoing of a man.